So I'm glad you're here at Google's Developers Festival. What is it? GDG Dev Fest, Google Developer Group Festival, uh, 2016. I'm going to teach you about using Go to create web applications. Part of that will be looking at uh, App Engine on Google Cloud. Okay, but mostly what I'm going to focus on in this hour is web apps with Go because I think that's what people need to know. Right? Like before you even get to App Engine, building web apps with the Go programming language, that's what we're going to look at. If you're in my previous section where we looked at the introduction to the Go programming language and you missed it, you could go to YouTube Todd McLeod, go down to playlists, and then, uh, or go down to videos, and I've just posted a video, it's uploading right now, of that presentation from the last hour. And, uh, and you could also go to Twitter, and here's my Twitter thing, right, at Todd underscore McLeod, and, uh, and I just posted up, right, and I'll post the video there too, but that's what we did in the last hour, so you could find that. And that will show you the resources, well, there's probably some people watching this online, so you can get to resources for what I'm going to talk about by going to here, W1, HF, HF BF, right, capital W. And, uh, and so anybody want to take a shot of that with your phone, I'll leave this up on the screen for a second. All right, ready? So uh, I sound a little bit intense just because there's a lot of information I'd like to cover in the shortest period of time, right? We only have about 30 or 40 minutes together. And so uh, the last one, I was fire hosing everybody with a bunch of information. I was drilled through it. So I wanted you to see kind of like, look at these fundamentals of language. Pretty cool. So we're going to, I don't know, I feel myself chilling out a little bit. So anyhow. Self-reflection. All right. So uh, if you want to learn web programming with Go, this is the current best playlist in the world for learning web programming with Go. And I would actually like to see one that's better. So if you find one that's better, send it to me. Go Lang Web Programming Fall 2016, uh, YouTube Todd McLeod. And then the code base for that is that goes to 11, Todd McLeod, Go Lang Web Dev. Okay, so that's the code base. And so everything I'm going to show you, you're going to be able to go to that code base. We're actually going to work in that code base today and in a temporary area or just a throwaway area, but I'm never throwing it away. So you'll always be able to go there and, and find the code uh, that we do today. So uh, that's it. I will soon have a new course on Udemy. So Udemy, Todd McLeod, I'm recording uh, Web Dev with Go right now. But if you want to learn the fundamentals of the Go programming language, it's right there. And if you want to learn how to do HTML and CSS properly, not like boot crap and jQuery and libraries and frameworks, but the absolute fundamentals, how do you actually use HTML and CSS, uh, this is a great course right here that's going to be online very soon. So it's in the final stages of approval. All right, so let's talk about web programming with Go. And I uh, am working in that Golang web dev code base. And uh, I think I'll just sort of walk through a couple of things. One of the most important things with web programming is templating. It's one of the three, three pillars of web programming. And so here we have templating. And uh, with templating, I don't know, there's part of me that just finds it easier to explain by coding it. So. Bum, ba, dum, ba. How many people are web programmers already? Let me see your hands. How many people are not? How many people don't know what I'm talking about when I say templating? Okay. So a template is basically how we get, you know, code. It's basically form letters. And so a basic form letter is like this, right? And we'll also create web pages this way. And so where we wanted to insert the username in our web page code, we just put in a little field. And then when the one user logs in, we know which user's logged in, and we get the data out of the database and we put the user's name there. That's how Facebook works, right? It's how all data-driven websites, pretty much all websites today work. And so to do templating, uh, there's a couple of things that we need to do. We need to have a template. So I'm going to create a new file here, a new HTML file. I'm going to call it index.goHTML. And, uh, and here's my, my Go template. And when the data comes in, the dot references the current piece of data. So I'm just going to display the data right there. And, uh, and now I need to write a little Go program to sort of let everybody know that template's there and I want to serve it to the web. 
Now, when you learn Go programming, there's the standard library. You go to golang.org, you go to documents, and you have the standard library down here, package documentation. Yeah, package documentation, and here's the standard library. I was actually looking for the phrase standard library. So these are all the different packages that have been written by the gods of computer science. So you missed the last hour. I really got interested in Go because of the credentials of Go, created at Google by Rob Pike, Ken Thompson, Robert Gressmer, some of the biggest heavy hitters in CompSci, same people who helped create Unix, C, UTF-8. So the credentials of Go really convinced me, right, created at Google by those three people, that this is a language I need to know about. It's built to take advantage of multiple cores. 2006, Intel released the first dual core processor. 2007, Google started creating a language to take advantage of multiple cores. Right? All that process and power. No other language before then, C, Java, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, no other language before then was built to take advantage of multiple cores. They were all built for a world where there's only a single core. And so Go is built to take advantage of multiple cores and built by the best software engineering firm in the world and built by some of the heaviest hitters in CompSci who helped create C, Unix, and UTF-8. I want to know that. All right? So here's the standard library. You can get to it at golang.org. I like going to godoc.org, which is some website some person put together, which has all of the standard library plus third-party packages. So I could come in here, and at the forward slash, I could just say, hey, show me the net library. And here's everything for low-level TCP, UDP networking. In this repo, I show you how to build up a server from scratch. HTTP runs on top of TCP. So in here, we build, understand TCP servers, we build a server from scratch. And we get it to handle HTTP requests. And we process those requests based upon what URI, what URL are you coming to, and what is your method? Is it post or get? The way the web works is if you look at like who defines the recommended standards for the web, it's the Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF. Right? So the Internet Engineering Task Force makes recommendations for how the web should be built. They put out recommend, re, uh, requests for comments. So RFC 7230 is like the most current HTTP, one of the, there's a couple here, right? But the, the most current HTTP version 1.1 spec for how you should be doing HTTP. If you go and you look at this, it describes how does HTTP work. And one of the things it talks about is this kind of a deal right there. Ah! That's not what I want to show you. <laughs> That's GitHub stuff. I'm looking for this one. It's over on this desktop. So every, you know, the web is client server architecture. We have clients using browsers a lot of the times, making requests. There's requests to servers. Servers write responses to the browser. That request and the response is just text, right? That text is formatted in a certain way. There are rules that the text has to conform to. Protocols. Protocols are rules. Hypertext transfer protocol. The rule for HTTP is that this text, these requests and responses, have to conform to a certain layout. That layout is just what you see in the screen here. You've got text coming over the line, and that text is just, you know, up here we have a start line, and then we have headers, and then we have body. Some people call this the payload, right? So that start line, when it's a request, you can barely see it there, it's called the request line. That start line, when it's a response, it's called the status line. It's not complex. If you get that, you just got a lot, right? So that's HTTP. And we build up a TCP server to take that text that's coming in. Look at the request line. The request line has to be you know, set to a certain format. Dear Lord, how'd I get out of this screen? Went, went. Ah, there we go. Couldn't get it to come up. You look at that request line, so we'll just go down here, message format, and then we have the start line, and we scroll down and we see how is that request line formatted, and there's the status line, and here is the request line. So the re request line has the method, get, post, the URI, right, go into this URL, URI, interchangeable pretty much, and then the version, and then a carriage return line feed, right, and then we have our headers, and then we have a blank line, and then we have our body. 
And then the start line has this stuff, the version, the status code, and the recent phrase. Anyhow, so we build up a TCP server, and we look at all that stuff, and we do all the routing, and building a TCP server for HTTP, so it's right here, and here you can see like, hey, we have, I mean, it's just code. It's just code, that's it. <laughs> it's just code. And we're saying, if something comes in git at this path, then run this code. If it comes in git at apply, right, then run this code. If it comes in post at apply, then run this code. Like, that's cool at the TCP level, right? Without even having to rely on some other package, we're able to build our own RESTful web server. Whoa. Whoa. Right? That's beautiful. But, so that's, I was talking about specification. So that, and I was talking about language or the standard library, right? So here is package net, godoc.org. You can look at the standard library at golang.org or you could go to godoc.org and there's this documentation for both the standard library and third party packages, right? So this is a standard library. There's the net package, TCP, and UDP stuff in there, and then we have net HTTP. And this is a lot of everything that we just did in that building a TCP server, HTTP server up at the TCP level. Everything that we did, the gods of computer science have already done it for us and done it better, right? So we could come into the HTTP package and we could start to use that stuff. So how do we use that stuff? So in the HTTP package, we go to the index, and there's a function here, listen and serve. That sounds pretty promising. And we go down, we go to listen and serve, and we have an address and we have a handler. Okay, so you need to understand interfaces before you get into the HTTP package. So if you do not understand interfaces and you want to learn this to use it, do not begin learning Go web programming or web programming with Go before you thoroughly understand interfaces. If you need to understand interfaces, take my introduction to the Go programming course on Udemy. Get a solid understanding of interfaces. Watch this video right here at this URL. We went over it in the last hour. I don't know if that's an I, a 1, or an L. I think it's an L, all right? Another L. So watch that video right there. That'll give you a sense of it. And, uh, and then once you understand interfaces, you need to understand the handler interface. The handler interface. To understand the HTTP package, this is the entry point to the HTTP package. You have to understand type handler. Type handler. So an interface says, hey, baby, if you have these methods, you're my type. So an interface is defining functionality. And look at what that interface says. Any type that has the serve HTTP method with the parameters of type response writer and a pointer to a request is also of type handler. If it's of type handler, wherever a handler is asked for, right, I could stick it in there. Because what handles a HTTP request and response? Serve HTTP handles a request and a response. And that's why it takes a request and a response. What is the web? The web, I gotta go to that one. The web is this, requests and responses, right? All right, so enough yammering, but it's important yammering, otherwise you'd be like, what is he doing? I could use HTTP listen and serve. And I'm going to launch my terminal and go change into Golang Web Dev and then change into, oh, yeah, I'll change into 000 and then change into 35 and 02. Am I not? I'm in 01 and go fumped my code. It'll format my code. And so this code will format here in hey, a second. Dad? Hey, Rio. Can I interrupt? Yeah. So come on in. How many of you know what Google Cardboard is? How many know you're all getting one? Listen, serve takes 8080, 
And then it takes a handler. So I need a handler. So I hot dog int. I could create my own type. String bool int, right? And those types can have underlying types. So type hot dog has an underlying type. And uh, var x is of type hot dog. And then I could create a func and it's going to take a hot dog and it's going to be serve HTTP and that'll take a, a response writer and a request pointer to an HTTP request. And then I could do something here. Format f print. So file print is one way I could do this. So file print, as you can see there, takes a writer. And that's the writer interface from package IO. And, uh, and response writer implements the writer interface. So we really lean on interfaces here. So I go uh, f print, and I'm going to print this to my response writer. And I'm going to say, hello, universe. Because we're really getting bigger. You know, we're starting to think about Mars, right? Elon Musk leading the charge on that. So type hot dog now is, so variable x is of type hot dog, but because type hot dog has serve HTTP response writer pointer to request, response writer pointer to request, right? Serve HTTP response writer pointer to request. It is also type handler, and this needs a handler. So I'm just going to put that there. And then the program knows, okay, I'm listening and serving on TCP port 8080. Web production, you do port 80, so 8080 is just for local. And my handler to handle all requests coming in is going to be this X, which is, has serve HTTP as a method attached to it, which means it's type handler, which means I can pass it in. So if I go run main.go, hello universe. Nice. Well, we could start to grow on that. We'll get back to templates. I know we are heading down the template road, but it's kind of a big ball of wax to unravel, and so you kind of just got to follow the flow when you start explaining it. So the next thing we might look at when we come to the net HTTP package, right? We saw listen and serve, so we might go just peruse the index. And, uh, and so listen and serve, if we read about that, it says, hey, if nil, if the handler is nil, then default serve mux is used. Hmm. So I come up here to the index. I'm like, what's a serve mux? Because we want to handle routes, right? Like you come in at this route, you got to do something. I come in, I look at what's a serve mux. Well, I've got this function, new serve mux. It gives me a pointer to serve mux. And then I have handle and handle func, right? And those look like they handle a pattern. And then, and then I could put a function here. And by the way, a serve mux has serve HTTP response writer and request, so that's a handler. So if I create a serve mux, I could pass that into listen and serve as the handler because it has this method. And then I also have these handle func things. That looks promising. So I'm going to uh, do a serve mux, and I'll do mux is colon equal to HTTP new serve mux. And by the way, this is the package dot right package dot some some like function or constant or variable from that package so sometimes you'll see things like uh, template dot template and you're like what the hell does that mean well from package template we're talking about maybe type template okay uh, and that's that's what that means right but that's the package and then this is something in the package a function a variable a constant okay how many people are completely lost? How many people are intrigued? Cool. So there's my new serve mux. That's a handler. Mux. Yeah, mux. And then I could do mux dot handle. And by the way, a hell's a mux. Sounds like we're talking about some kind of dog here. All right, boy, let me tell you, when I was young, I had a mux. And that mux could herd the sheep like none other. It was like a collie mux. 
I don't know why mux makes me think of mutt. But a mux, a multiplexer, a server, a router, when we talk about web programming, man, we are talking about the same thing. So normally we call it a server. When you hear mux, just think server. When you hear multiplexer, just think server, right? Sometimes it'll be referred to as a router, just think server. It's routing requests, it's multiplexing, meaning many input are coming in, and it's choosing, a or one input's coming in, and it's choosing a path out of many possible choices, kind of what a multiplexer does. Another way to refer to it, it's very engineering. Go is built by geniuses, which means the re most of the, for the most of the rest of us, when we read it, we're going to be like, I don't understand much of this. Because this is a genius level. Okay? The guy that I know that's a corporate trainer for Go, took him six months to understand the language spec. <laughs> I hear people talk sometimes, like Go Time FM, which is a podcast for the Go programming language. And some of the people who are on there, when they get honest, they're like, Man, I still don't understand some of the language spec because it's written by geniuses. The rest of us are operating with the older core, <laughs> a little less RAM. So now we're going to try this handle funk thing, and I'm going to say, when you go to this route, uh, I'm going to have you run foo. So I could clean my code up a little bit here. I could get rid of this because I'm no longer doing that thing where I'm creating my own handler, and I could get rid of that. And what is what is handle funk need? Handle funk needs a pattern, and this is a type. That's a type. So it needs a value of that type. So the value we're passing in is <clears throat> we're passing in that function right there. I'm just going to reorganize this. All right. So that should all still run. I created a new serve mux. I'm using handle funk, which is a method attached to it. So in the documentation, when we look at that, we have, hey, we got a new serve mux, gave us a pointer to a serve mux. These are the receivers right here in the function declaration. You'll get this if you get the introduction to Go programming, which we did in the last hour, right? It implements the type handler interface implicitly without having to explicitly declare it because it has this method. An interface says, hey baby, if you have these methods, you're my type. So type mux is, type pointer to serve mux is also type handler now, right? And then we were able to pass that in to listen and serve because listen and serve wants a handler. So we passed in that what we created. And then we said, okay, serve mux has these methods. So we're going to use the handle funk method, which wants a function. So we're giving it a function. You could write that function right here, right? You could just say funk, but that gets like messy to me. So I think this is cleaner. Now we're going to run this code. Hello universe. And we could create new routes. Oops. I'm making this one bar just so you can see there's nothing special between the route that's being conditional logic upon and the function which is being called those don't have to be the same name okay some people sometimes think oh it had to be that way Ladies and gentlemen, we just built a website. 
That's it. That's beautiful and easy once you get that clear pathway through the documentation. Once you understand interfaces and once you understand type handler and the net HTTP package. Right? So now all we have to do is start parsing templates. You ready for this? Var TPL is a pointer to from package template type template. I am just declaring that I have a variable and I have to import the right package. I'm just declaring that I have a variable TPL of type template. And that type is from package template and it needs to be a pointer. And if you don't understand pointers and addresses and passing addresses as opposed to values, make sure you watch my introduction to the Go programming language course on Udemy and you'll get it. Now I'm going to use, and you'll notice that there's, all, there's a, both a package template a package template from HTML and text. So text template is the foundation for templating. HTML template is everything which text template is and more. HTML template is built upon text template. HTML template includes context aware escaping which prevents all kinds of bad attacks on the web like cross-site scripting. So I'm going to use HTML template. I'm going to use a special font called init. This is for program setup. When my program loads, it's going to do all this setup. I'm going to parse all my... Are there any kids in here? Who's under the age 18? Raise your hand. Cool. I'm going to parse all my... I just need to know that so I can moderate my language because I was just going to get a little bit sassy. I'm going to parse all my templates. I'm going to put them in a folder templates. All right, so I'm going to drop that in there. You can call. These, this is just coding, boys and girls. This is just straight up coding. You can call these whatever file you want. You just have to then tell your program to go get those files, use those files. I could call those PHP files if I want to confuse people. Or if I'm just nostalgic for the good old days. So now I'm going to parse my templates. TPL is equal package template must, which is a wrapper. And then it's going to be template parse glob. I'm going to give it a pattern. And I'm going to say, hey, everything that's inside templates, everything that's inside templates, <clears throat> parse it. <clears throat> this is like a bucket. <clears throat> when you parse templates, go, go, go uh, HTML, by the way, is the traditional extension. So when you parse templates, when you parse templates, they all get put in here, okay? And now I'm going to be able to use my templates. So I need to go look at uh, the package documentation, godoc.org. And I'll look at uh, HTTP, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, HTML template. There we go. HTML template. And I have, uh, I did, let's see, I did parse glob, which gives me a pointer to a template in an error. But then I passed that inside, I wrapped that inside must. And since this returns a pointer to a template in an error, and that takes a pointer to a template in an error, I can stick parse glob inside of that. Basically, must just handles the error. And that just returns a pointer to a template. So I assign that to my TPL. And I put this up at the, the, pack, at the, the package scope, right? Up at package main package scope. So that this is going to be accessible down here in my func main. And so then when I have that, I have template execute template where it takes a writer. And then it takes the name of the template and then it takes any data I want to pass in and it returns an error. So cool. So for each of these routes I can now do tpl dot execute template. I could pass in the writer, I could pass in the name, and I could pass in no data at first.
and I want to hand, handle my air. Air handling in Go is handled like right next to where the errors are returned. Well, hell. You are at index. You are at dog. Let's pass some data in now. So to pass data in, we put our data right here. So I'm going to pass in 42. I'm going to pass in 7. Restart it. How could you possibly leave? You are at index 42. I passed in data. You are at index. You are at dog. I passed in 7. So you pass in some data structure, and you can start to do things with that data structure. I have all kinds of examples in this re repo about how to do things with the data. So for instance, hands-on <laughs> solution. That's not the one I want. Composition. So here we have uh, academic year. It's made up of a fall, spring, and summer semester. A semester is the term and the courses, which is made up of a slice of course. A course is a number, a name, and the units, right? That's what a course is, CIT 90 data-driven websites, three units. Now I'm going to you know, create a variable of type year. Right? So I'm going to create a value of type year. It'll have a fall and a spring semester. Semester will have a term. I'm just putting that in there so I could access it as a string. It'll have courses. So here's my course, each of those structs. Right? The number, the name, and the units. And then I take that entire year and I pass it into my template. When I get to my template, I can say, hey, Fall term, range over the fall courses, print out the number, the name, and the units, stop. So when I run that, 1103. That's text template. I'm not doing it to a web page. I'm just doing package text template. That is the most beautiful, elegant, clean, powerful, and performant solution to creating web pages today, and I emphasize performant. This is lightning fast and scalable, and you stick it up on App Engine, and you have built an app which is running at the scale and power, running at the power, and maybe not the scale, the power of Google. So how do we deploy to App Engine? I go to App Engine Deploy. So I've got a nice little readme file here. Golang Web Dev, App Engine Deploy. And here are the instructions for deploying to App Engine. What is App Engine? Google Cloud. Right? Products. There's different levels of service which you could get. You could get infrastructure as a service. 
platform as a service, software as a service. I want App Engine, which is like platform as a service. View App Engine docs, different languages for App Engine. I want Go. The flexible environments can be closer to IAAS. The standard environments can be closer to PAAS. So I'm going to go here, Go, platform as a service. Quick start, it's going to walk me through how to get everything started. But that's exactly what I've streamlined for you right here. Install Google App Engine. Make sure you've got version 2.7.x. By the way, Python's nice to code in, but it's not a good language to code in. The creator of the language said it's not a good language. He broke backwards compatibility from version 2 to version 3. He thought version 2 sucks so bad. It's a big deal to break backwards compatibility. Everybody had already written a shit ton of code in version 2. So they said, we're not going to follow you because we don't want to rewrite all of our code. So most people stayed with version 2. Version 3 went on, this dude Guido, you know, who created the language who I'd never heard of before, right? I mean, but you need Python for this. So there's a lot of code out there in Python, but go for go at this point forward if you're like, should I learn, a lang what language should I learn? You got to configure some environment path variables. Uh, Google Cloud Developer Console, create a project. You get the project ID, so you go to Google Cloud Developer Console, and you say Google Cloud Console, and you create a project, and then you get a project ID. So here are my projects and different IDs, so I get like an ID, and then I configure a little configuration file, right? So here is like a little configuration file. I just put my little ID in there, and this basically says, hey, I'm using Go, and this is the first version of this application. And, uh, and then once I've done that, right, uh, I use this little code right there. So that's just some crazy command line voodoo. Copy that. You could also, uh, there's slightly abbreviated versions that you might use, which I'll show you on if you set up your environment the right way. But this is like the most... Uh, thorough, and you change, put your project ID right in that chunk of code right there. I'm going to copy that. And, uh, and then you could go view your project. The hell did I go? This is what I want. You go view your project at your project ID.appspot.com. So right now this is what I have deployed there. Just a teaching example for doing a perfect above the fold layout. If you don't know what that means, you need to take my HTML, CSS course. If you do not know how to use SVGs, you need to go to Udemy, Todd McLeod, and you need to take my HTML, CSS course if you do not know how to use SVGs. If you do not know so many things, now I sound like Trump. <laughs> Huge. It's huge. This course is huge. The course is huge. The outline for the course is the outline for the course. You want to see the outline for the HTML, CSS course? HTML, CSS, files. No, that's not what I want. Oh, yeah, that is what I want. Here's the outline, and we'll come back to it because it's going to need a minute to load. So that's what's deployed there right now. I could come back to uh, my terminal. And 026 was it, and 01. And, uh, and then I need to change, get, get my little project ID, and change that little project ID part. And, uh, and then at 01, I have a slightly different website. So now I'm going to deploy what's at 01. So now we've deployed a new website. For those of you who know the classic Richard Bachman, Bach or Bachman, I can't remember, book, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Here's another, using Flexbox, if you don't know Flexbox, above the fold, SVGs, you should take my course, uh, right? But using Flexbox for the layout, and this is a, a modern take on Jonathan Livingston Siegel. He's a bird who really liked to fly, and now he's, uh, he's it's the Halloween take. He's returned with a vengeance. <laughs> But the nice thing about the above the fold on that is no matter what size I come to on this, the break is always in the same spot, right? 
So that's above the fold, like above the fold on a newspaper. So that's deploying. I'm going to switch to O2, and I like that other version, so I'm just going to deploy that one back. And uh, it's beautiful. It's easy. After I say I bled so much trying to figure it out, I started trying to learn Go with a book that was originally written in Chinese and translated to English. So I pointed this out in the last training, because in two years ago, the language was only version 1 in 2012. And I started to learn it in 2014. Right? So uh, even just two years ago, there are so few resources out there. The language has gained incredible momentum. And now that I've figured it out, a lot of things are a lot more clear. And what I showed you in the last hour, I really wish somebody had been able to show me two years, two and a half years ago, you know? So uh, you can take what I've learned in this code base, and you could really go somewhere with it. And you could really learn the best solution for building web apps today. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, how does it go mingle with Polymer? I think Polymer is all front-end type of stuff. And, you know, so Go can interface with front-end uh, frameworks and applications. Often there's just JSON that's passed back and forth, data being passed back and forth between back-end and front-end. So Go is completely fine and and very capable, very the, the most performant solution for handling requests coming to a server, regardless of what where those requests are coming from or what front end framework you're using. So I don't know any I don't know much about uh, Polymer. I do know uh, Zeno Roca, and he's a buddy of mine. And Zeno, uh, I hired him summer 2015, and he did a, a week training on. Uh, Polymer, and we did a week training on web components, but I know it's a nice way to create a, a, a pretty front end pretty quick, but that's about all I know about it, even after two weeks of web components and Polymer. My decision at the time, summer 2015, was that web components and Polymer aren't quite there, and I'm a purist. I'm a fundamentalist. I really believe that you should just know HTML and CSS and some server-side technology and a touch of JavaScript. Like, there's so many things you could do with just, uh, with just HTML and CSS that people aren't even aware of. Let me just point one of them out, because this is like blows people's minds, right? So let me uh, open recent and HTML, CSS, boot camp. And it's down towards the bottom. And we have sidebar. So here's the code. And here's the code. 58 lines of CSS, and the code that makes most of that is just layout, and this code right here, and uh, this right here, right? Those are the six lines which are going to do this magic. You don't need JS. Most things, you don't need JS. But everybody's like, shoot, I need JS. Shoot, JS is complicated. Shoot, jQuery. OK, man, 300 kilobytes down to your client. OK, now I want to use uh, icons. Fave icon cheat sheet. Fave icon cheat sheet. Cool, all these fave icons. Sorry, font awesome. Font awesome cheat sheet. Cool, all these. Uh, all these uh, I, fave icons, something else, which I'll teach you my HTML, CSS course too. Font awesome cheat sheet. Awesome, I could use all these different fonts, right? Uh, all these different icons. It's two hours of talk and my brain's ready for a break. Two out. see I can't even talk anymore. But to do that, I'm downloading 100 kilobytes to the client. If you extract these and turn them into SVGs, which I show you how to do in my HTML, CSS course, if you're not tired of me saying that, but I teach this, right? And so I need, I will want people to learn it. I show you how to extract those into SVGs. I could get like the 10 SVGs I need and it's like five kilobytes sent to the client. And so the average web page today is 2,200 to 2,400 kilobytes, 2.2 to 2.4 megabytes, right? And the page that we're creating, you know, is, uh, 400 kilobytes, it's a sixth the size. And we're talking about performance is one of the biggest metrics for correlation between a website and its success.
right? Amazon shaves off 100 milliseconds, their sales go up 1%. Whoa, people are sensitive. They are. It's a true statistic, right? All right, so, uh, so I don't know what got me on that track, but what was the question? Polymer? Any other questions? Any other questions? Cool. Don't go just yet. I'm going to stop the video and then I...